Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to Special Library Association's 2018 Kickoff Competitive Intelligence Webinar Series. We have a great year lined up for you with a webinar every month focusing on the art and business of competitive intelligence. My name is Elizabeth Lamoureux, CID member and one of your webinar hosts along with Mr. Jim Miller. Before we start, we would like to thank our webinar sponsor, Aurora WDC. Aurora WDC provides a technology platform for this webinar, as well as financial support for the division. Aurora WDC is the organizer and host of the annual Reconverge G2 Intelligence Leadership Symposium going on April 24th through the 26th in Madison, Wisconsin. The three-day Reconverge G2 event is a completely immersive experience. This year, it will focus on the culture and values of our intelligence practice and how to better embed them within our organizations, especially given the disruption coming from new technologies. We invite you to learn more and to register for the conference at reconverge.net. And now a few housekeeping details before we kick off. It will be in the chat box for you as well. During the webinar, we invite you to submit questions and we will not post them publicly. They will be answered at the end of Julie's presentation. All attendees are in listen mode only. And later today, you will receive an email including a YouTube link to this recording, along with the link to slacid.org to register for future webinars. And now you are in for a superstar treat. From computer screen to television screen, our super CI guest is none other than Julie Clegg. Julie is a world-class licensed investigator, CEO and founder of Human Eye Intelligence Services, global educator, star of the reality show Hunted, creator of the podcast, How to Become a World-Class Investigator, an in-demand international presenter and in March has the release of a book titled How to Become a World-Class Investigator. And now, How to Incorporate the Human Element in Automated Intelligence Gathering with Julie Clegg. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Liz, for that introduction. And hi, everybody that's listening to this webinar today and is with us. I'm really excited to be here and I'm excited to share this information on this very important subject with you. So I do invite your questions um, whenever, you know, during the presentation and towards the end, uh, please submit your questions and we'll do our best to answer those as we're going along. So I'll give you a little bit of my background. Uh, Liz has already introduced me there, but I'll just share my background with you. Uh, I'm an ex-detective from the West Yorkshire Police in the UK. I was a detective for around 10 years, undercover operator. I was uh, responsible for uh, source handling, uh, dealing with potentially dangerous offenders, sex offenders, uh, visiting them in prison and doing interviews and, and various things there. I moved over to North America in 2004 to take up a position with Toddington International at that time, uh, educating law enforcement, government, military, and the Fortune 500s uh, globally on uh, using the internet as an investigative research tool and, and how to be more successful using particularly online open source intelligence. So over those years, uh, I've also become proficient and qualified in um, subjects like geographic profiling, uh, intelligence, anal uh, intelligence analysis, and I've also started to um, be a cast member on the UK show Hunted. So we've just, uh, it's the third season that's showing at the moment. We've also done a celebrity version. Uh, it's um, a surprisingly successful show. It was, uh, it was really meant to initially be a, um, a social experiment and it ended up turning into a, a fairly successful show. So I'm excited to be a part of that too. But today, the focus of our subject is really talking about the uh, the complementary fields of human intelligence and artificial intelligence, technology, 
but I want to I want to first of all dive into um, how to identify yourself as an investigator. So in this professional grade training session, I'm going to show you how to navigate the technical landscape with speed and confidence. We're going to talk about why nature versus nurture really matters to your career and the single most important thing you can learn to be a successful investigator. We're going to talk about why intelligence, why artificial intelligence in particular and machine learning, uh, why they matter, what they are, why they're game changers in our industry and what that means to you in terms of your career and your investigative capability and your researching. So I chose the topic for this webinar really for two main reasons. Uh, firstly, the, the single most important and valuable thing I've learned what, over the course of my 20 year career has been how to communicate effectively and build relationships. I can't, I can't even tell you how important that is. And we're gonna talk more about that today. And as for the second reason, well, we're at a critical junction in the evolution of this industry without a doubt um, you know the technology and the convergence of uh, all of the the different types of technology which we're going to talk more about um, is changing the industry as we know it but I also want to remember that ultimately we're humans investigating humans there's a reason that I named my company human eye so human eye intelligence services because I want to keep the humanity within our industry in the face of technology and so that's the purpose of today's discussion now, anybody that monitors me on social media or follows uh, some of the content that I put out there will know that I'm actually quite outspoken on the subject of artificial intelligence and maintaining the humanity in our industry. I believe the, in the future of investigation as a much more collaborative industry than it is right now. And, and this is something that I'm really focusing the, my career on right now is this whole message. So a lot of my time right now is dedicated to the integ integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning with human intelligence in investigations. And you may have heard this term, but this is known as augmented intelligence. So when we talk about humanity and we talk about humans investigating other humans, I've heard it said that um, you know, investigation comes naturally. You're born an investigator. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that you are or are not. And then I've also heard other people say um, that, you know, it's it, anybody can learn this, that it's really just a set of skills that is applied to um, the work that you choose to do. So I, you know, depending on where you sit on that spectrum, um, personally, I think it's a combination of both. So you know, these skills such as how to read body language, how to use certain technologies, how to conduct surveillance, um, you know, these are skills that can be taught, but there are certain skills that cannot be taught that are intrinsic to your personality. Um, you know, we can learn things like emotional intelligence, but empathy tends to be something that's much more ingrained in us and inbuilt from a very young age. So my 20 years in this industry has taught me that it's a lot more complicated than just being nature versus uh, nurture. Uh, investigation really is intrinsically human on all levels and who you are is every bit as important as what you know. And this comes down to everything from the way that you're raised. So your early years and the, the things that you learn, the skills, the life skills, the influences that you have right down to um, whether or not you have siblings, how you're treated by your parents, how you were treated at school, whether you're academically um, smart or whether you struggled at school, how many friends you had, uh, whether you're religious, whether you're politically inclined, uh, even whether or not you grew up in a house where there was corporal punishment, all of these things influence who we are and whether or not we, uh, you know, our mindset shifts in a certain way. So that's something that's very much of interest to me right now. Um, and I really believe that, you know, you can, you can take all the training available to create these skills and create this skill set. You can learn about surveillance, you can learn about um, profiling, but if you don't know 
who you are fundamentally, then you won't ever be able to reach your true potential. And I really feel very strongly about this. So I've been, I've worked this past 12 months or so working with a large number of investigators and doing some research into this whole subject. So one of the questions that came up out of this as a result of all this research is, how do you discover who you are and where your true strengths are? So I've brought it, I've boiled it down to three main categories. The first one being, it begins with your ethical boundaries and your personal rules of morality. And there's a gray area there between right and wrong. It's, uh, it's interesting, when I used to do undercover work, which was certainly part of my career for a few years while I was in the police, there is a very fine line, a very gray area um, between police and criminals in undercover work. You're having to act like a criminal, you're having to get into the mindset of a criminal, and you're doing that from the other side. And of course, we do this in investigation all the time. If you engage your empathy and your emotional intelligence, then you there is that gray area and that fine line. So you have to be very, very firm and set those boundaries with respect to both uh, your moral compass and, and your ethical line. And you have to be very firm on that. And then, of course, there's certain personality traits that do tend to be more nature, such as empathy and compassion, whereas the other ones that are more nurture are emotional intelligence, patience, active listening, things that you can learn rather than things that, that are you know, within, you, within yourself. One of the other things that we hear bias talked about all the time in, in intelligence circles, and it is very, very important, I often find that people talk about biases without really examining themselves and, and looking to see what their biases exactly are. You know, our biases determine how we see the world and how we filter and process information, whether we understand that and really realize that or not. Uh, our biases tend to be hardwired. They can be difficult to detect, and there's even a bias for that, um, blind spot bias that tells us that we can't even see our own biases. So uh, it's, uh, it can be a difficult thing to be self-aware about, but we have to really try. Um, you know, looking, in, looking at some of the resources for self-examination of biases and prejudices, which is another thing that people don't like to admit that they have, but we all have prejudices. We are all raised in such a way that, give, that brings these presence, uh, prejudices to mind. There's a great website, uh, mentalfloss.com, that's great for looking at uh, everything to do with the mental elements of um, you know, investigation, self-examination, all that kind of thing. So I just pulled a couple of slides from that just to show you where you can go through and have a look at the kinds of biases that exist that really influence our decisions and particularly when it comes to the processing of intelligence and the analysis of that because we're not really able to see where our biases sit and trying to look at information through an unfiltered lens is almost impossible. So rather than thinking that we don't have biases, what I would encourage people to do is to go through even these slides pick out your biases, recognize them. I've been, I've done this. I know exactly where my biases are. I know exactly where I'm susceptible to influence and where I'm fairly uh, clear in my, in my focus and my vision. And, um, you know, you just recognizing that you, you may not be able to overcome your biases, but recognizing first of all, that you have them. And secondly, that they influence your decision-making and how you can mitigate that somewhat is very, very important. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at this website or other websites similar to it and really know yourself. So the next step I find in knowing yourself as a human is to determine your passion, the thing that inspires you and motivates you. However unrelated it may seem to research or investigation or your world, you can use it to elevate your mindset and to build your network. And I'll give some examples of this uh, in a moment. Some of, some of the conversations I've had with people over the, uh, over the last 12 months when I've been doing this research. And then finally, think about what unique skills you have. What do you bring to the table in terms of expertise and experience? So where have you focused your learning? So 
where these elements intersect, so we're talking about your morals and ethics, your passion and your skill set, is that where those where those crossover is the area that you can really shine in investigation and where you're going to find the most fulfillment, the most joy in your work, you're going to be innovative and you're really going to be able to move forward in your career and in your purpose. I call it your purpose point. So I've created that here just to show you. And, um, you know, this is a, a really important thing to keep in mind. This, uh, you know, I've worked in it for many, many years aligning these areas and there may be areas that you lack. So your, your morals and ethics may guide you in a certain way. It may be something that's truly, truly important to you that you believe in and that's, uh, you know, that guides your life, but you don't have the skills. So you need to go out and get those skills or you may have, you know, certain skills and, and your morals and ethics may align, but you're just not really interested in the thing that is, uh, you know, that you're working in right now. And so you've got your skill set, you're really skilled in a certain area. Um, you know where your moral boundaries are, but you don't know what your passion is or you're not pursuing your passion or following that. So one of the, um, one of the examples I give here is I had a, a woman, I was talking to a, a young female investigator. And as a result of the TV show, I have a lot of people writing to me on a daily basis. I get, uh, you know, several hundred messages every week. Um, and usually the theme is around, how do I get to do what you do? What you do looks so cool. And, you know, you're, you're living my dream life. I, I get a lot of that. And so how do I get to do what you do? Because I don't, you know, I, I don't really have any experience or I don't really know about investigation. Where do I start? So I, I use this slide that you see here to create a framework for them. So I start off by saying, okay, well, what are you really interested in? What do you know about? What's your passion? And where do you sit morally in terms of the things that are important to you? So this particular woman said, well, I don't really know an awful lot, but I spend all of my time, um, you know, buying and selling expensive handbags and purses on eBay. And, um, you know, so I know an awful lot about eBay. I know an awful lot about designer labels and brand names. And, um, you know, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. I'm very conversant with social media. Uh, so I said, okay, so what's really important to you? If you had to pick a cause or something that really mattered to you in the world, what would that be? And this girl said, uh, you know, human trafficking is, is something that I would really like to get into, um, you know, eventually. So I said, well, you know, if you combine your skills, which is social media and the internet and buying and selling and uh, being conversant and understanding the language and the terminology around um, online retail, your passion is designer labels and you want to get into human trafficking. So there is a convergence there. Find the convergence point, your purpose point in the middle. I said, how about you um, educate yourself on supply chains for designer labels that are counterfeit? And then you can take your information, do some research around that, uh, find some, there's tons of nonprofit organizations in the world and even the, the big brand names such as, let's say Nike, that might need some help and would benefit from you identifying supply chains that might be resulting in human trafficking or work with them to help them remove counterfeit goods from the internet because that really helps their brand. So there's, there's any number of ways you can move forward when you don't really feel like you necessarily have any skills, but there is there may well be some value in something that you know that doesn't necessarily relate to investigation. So, and you know, when, when you align these three things, however they are, you can pick out the area that may well be a future career for you. And, it may, and there's probably gonna be things that you need to learn, but having, uh, this convergence of these three main things I find is uh, is a great starting point for people that want to get into this industry or change career or um, shift what they're doing in their job right now. So one of the other things that I find really to be important and again that I'm really driving right now in this industry is if you don't have the skills 
um, all the, the knowledge to pursue the area that aligns with your passions and your morals, then collaboration and mentorship becomes more important than ever. This is something that I cannot stress enough. So I was out of the investigation world directly for quite a while. Um, I was a police officer for 10 years and then I, I went into the education field and I was still aligned with investigation in that I was teaching, working with the police and working with um, government agencies, but I wasn't directly investigating on the front line. And while I was speaking to investigators, I wasn't really entrenched in the industry. When I came back to the investigation industry, the front lines, if you like, a few years ago, I found that with the technology and um, you know just the, the changes in the industry as it was and the generation, things had really, really shifted. And I felt quite lost in how do I get started again as an investigator? And I really empathized with people coming into this industry for the first time. So I decided to reach out to a number of people in my industry that I admired, and not just in my industry, not just in investigation, but in complementary industries and also just in the business world, to find a mentor or somebody that could help me bridge my knowledge gaps and really get started in the, you know, working back as, a, as an investigator again on an international basis. And what I found was every single person, so 100% of the people that I reached out to did not respond to me. They may have responded with a polite, yeah, I can't really help you or yeah, I, uh, I don't really have the time to, to deal with this. And I wasn't asking for anything more than, can we just sit down and have a cup of coffee and can I talk to you about the investigation industry and your observations of where it is right now? There was not... Uh, a sense of collaboration. There was no sense of unity that I found. If anything, it had become even more closed off and secretive than it was when I was involved in it 10 years ago. And not only that, I found this generation gap with the people that were 40 plus that were very experienced investigators had been like me, had been doing this for you know, over 20 years, and were very, very skilled and experienced in some areas. And then there was this younger generation, the digital natives, the millennial uh, generation, that were absolutely fantastic when it came to technology. They really knew the, the language, they understood what they were talking about when it came to online investigation, but they did not have the investigative experience and the knowledge and skill set of the older generation. So, the very practical experience, things like surveillance, um, you know, the forensics, just knowing what's possible in an investigation, the investigative interviewing techniques and, you know, that the analysis that it can take years to learn. So that the, the thing that I recognized was this huge gap in the middle. Nobody would talk to me and I could find, I could talk to one end of the spectrum or I could talk to the other and get very different information, but not really anybody in the middle. And there's this huge generation gap that has occurred in these last few years where, you know, the, the exponential technological growth and the complexity of the technology now means that each generation, that older generation and the younger generation is now missing vital knowledge and skills and people are not really talking to each other. So in my view, mentorship has now become multi-directional rather than just top down. So in the past, it's always been if you were looking for a mentor, and this was my experience when I tried to go out and find a mentor, was that I was reaching out to people like myself or people that had more experience than I did to try and guide me back into the industry and give me a sense of what the landscape in the investigation world look like right now, rather than going to the younger generation who were very technologically savvy and finding information from them as well. And I think one of the important things that we really need to change in this industry is to recognize that mentorship is now multi-directional and that the older generation has as much to learn from the younger generation as the other way around and we need to talk to each other now more than ever we have to learn to collaborate 
uh, we have, you know, we've got to share information because there's so many ways that we can do that. The opportunities have never been better for us to learn from each other. Um, you know, social networks now uh, facilitate global collaboration. And this is one of the things I've focused on in the last couple of years. And I've built an incredible network of people in these last couple of years. When I realized that the issue was one of collaboration and mentorship, I changed my mindset and I started to reach out to people with uh, collaboration and mentorship in mind, reassuring people that I'm not trying to steal your business. I'm not trying to take away your clients or you know, trying to get myself into your organization, but let's share what we know. Let's each share the bits of information and you, you, just, you just don't know where that's gonna take you if we collaborate and we treat each other as equals and as peers. You know, the expertise that's out there and the sharing of that intelligence on a global basis it has never been more important. And, you know, the, the world is, our work is not local now, our work is global. And the information that we have to share is global. And there are some very, very smart people out there that can teach us a thing or two. So I was pondering on this. Uh, I was, you know, this is this kind of thing has kept me awake at night for for many nights in the past twelve months as I've uh, as I've been coming back into this world with a fresh set of eyes. And I woke up one morning with this thought that I just couldn't shake, and it was the thing that has made me create the world class investigator brand. Um, the podcast, uh, the mentorship program that I'm creating, and led to me writing the book that I've just written um, and that will be out soon, was, can you imagine how we could change the world if every investigator shared their knowledge? And this isn't just investigators, this is researchers, this is anybody that has access to any kind of information that they could share that would be beneficial to the rest of the world. So I'm thinking of things in the areas of human trafficking, terrorism and organized crime. All of these big major subjects that a lot of us know many things about. Where this really hit me was the Las Vegas shooting. And I looked at the, I kept a close eye on the subsequent investigation of that, and not just in Las Vegas, but in various other states, the ripple effect that occurred and some of the intelligence that was known in various other states that, you know, I mean, it's easy to look with hindsight, but had some of the intelligence been disseminated or known or shared, then I'm not saying the Las Vegas shooting would have been prevented, but there are many crimes and incidents that could have been prevented had information been shared. So I'll give you an example. There's a case in the United Kingdom right now of uh, an individual, or we believe it's an individual, that is murdering cats. So at first, when this first came to my attention, it was about 18 months ago to two years ago, and this person at that time had killed around 30 cats. And these were, he wasn't just killing these cats, he was dis dismembering these cats and he was leaving the corpses on the doorstep of the house that the cat belonged to. So this went undetected for quite some time because he was smart and he, and I'm calling him, he, it may well be a female. So they um, were, going around various areas they weren't sticking to one jurisdiction so they were going to a number of areas but all around the the central london region and killing all these cats and the police did not detect this because it didn't flag up in any of their systems because they were not sharing informational uh, information um, in a cross-jurisdictional way so it was actually a vet that detected that there was a pattern here and that this was potentially a serial offender based on complaints he had received from animal shelters and various other people. And he had collated all of that information and took it to law enforcement. Unfortunately, by that time, this individual had honed their craft. And now two years later, they're now believed to be responsible for the murder of at least 250 cats 
in various jurisdictions and areas in the south of England, all based around uh, one motorway um, passage. And they're still at large. They haven't been caught. They've now moved on to larger animals. And of course, the fear is that one day, if they don't get caught, they're going to start murdering humans. But I genuinely believe, I've looked into this case quite a lot, and I firmly believe that had this information been shared sooner, had people talked to each other sooner, had we, if we had a, an environment of sharing and collaboration instead of what we have right now and what I see in a lot of cases, and I'm not saying it's every case, of people being secretive and protective of their information, then I think that we would do better as um, an industry. So to get to that place, I believe that we have to let go of ego and fear. We have to stop feeling like somebody's going to steal our work or we're not going to be seen as important enough. We're not going to get promoted if we don't, uh, if we're not the person that identified that piece of information or solved that crime. We have to be more collaborative and, and not worry so much as an industry about individual um, recognition. There are countless ways to build mutually beneficial relationships based on trust and the sharing of information. It has been my experience very recently that the more we give, the more we receive. Um, you know, I've started doing my podcast and I've also started to create my mentorship program. And so I have at least two dozen people that I've called upon recently to assist me in this project. And because of the relationship that we've built, all of these people have been extremely willing to take part in these, uh, to either be a guest on my podcast or to take part in my mentorship program, asking for nothing in return, except the opportunity to elevate this industry. And it's because we've built trust, we've built loyalty. Um, you know, it, it's not a case of anybody looking good or trying to do something that uh, that fits in with their ego. It's about elevating this industry. And I really do believe that as we come into this period of significant change, that, um, that it's more important than ever that we talk to each other, that we share, that we keep the humanity in our industry. So as we start to uh, use more and more artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have to understand, first of all, what those things are and how that fits into our humanity and how that fits into our skill set that we have in order to uh, merge those two and augment um, our human intelligence with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I just wanted to put this up here so you can see the definition of artificial intelligence. Very, very important that we understand what that is. So look at number two particularly, of course we know it's branch of computer science number one, but if we look at number two, it's the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. So think about what that means when we talk about imitation of intelligent human behavior. And then think about that in terms of machine learning. So this is intelligent machines that are able to continue to learn independently of human input. So this is um, a human programming a machine uh, with a certain algorithm or a certain process, and then that machine goes off and learns by itself, does its own thing, continues to develop its own knowledge without human input. This is the definition of uh, machine learning from the expert system website. So machine learning, an application of artificial intelligence that provides the ability to automatically learn without being explicitly programmed. So after that initial input, the machine effectively goes off and teaches itself and continues to develop. Now that to me, while I'm excited by artificial intelligence, I'm, I, I have always been entrenched in technology and interested in it, we are at a fundamental shift point in our lifetime, in our industry, and in the way that business will be done from this point forward. So to me, we have to really take this very seriously and we have to really think about what this means in terms of how is this going to change the way that we do things 
if machines are able to teach themselves, how do we keep those human elements, compassion, empathy, active listening, body language reading, instinct, how do we keep these things in our industry? These are very fundamental traits. So to me, the ideal scenario is that of augmented intelligence and understanding what that is, where humans and machines can combine their skills for the best results. So augmented intelligence is according to uh, tech target, their what is um, definition of augmented intelligence. It's an alternative conceptualization of artificial intelligence that focuses on artificial intelligence's assistive role emphasizing the fact that it's designed to enhance human intelligence rather than replace it. So this to me is, is the future of our industry and we have to work towards making this a reality. So while the machines can process huge amounts of data and intelligence extremely quickly and accurately, depending on the input and how that's put there in the first place, of course, garbage in, garbage out, uh, machines cannot reason, they can't discern or rationalize, they can't feel empathy or compassion, they can't read body language or use instinct, which makes them the ideal partner in our research and investigations. So if you think about how, how our minds get, uh, think about biases, think about how difficult it can be to analyze huge amounts of information, if we offload the heavy mental lifting to machines, to an algorithm that is designed to conduct analysis based on a certain uh, set of parameters that we input, then that means that we are able to focus our thinking on the discernment, on those nuances that a machine cannot detect. So the areas where I am currently using um, augmented intelligence, so certainly geospatial intelligence. If you think of the types of tools that we can use um, for geofencing, so if you want to look at social media postings from a certain area, you can, there's certain programs where you can ring fence a location or a region or a house and pull out all the social media readings from that location uh, going back around 12 months. Well, that wouldn't be possible without augmented intelligence or without uh, artificial intelligence. Same with link analysis. A lot of these very technical link analysis programs, and I'm talking about the ones where you don't have to input the data. So the data is automatically brought from the web based on certain parameters that you input. You don't have to input the data. The data is scraped from online sources that you define and the analysis is done and provided to you for your further human analysis. Uh, social profiling, of course, there's numerous websites out there that do that and numerous um, programs and algorithms. Image recognition, of course, reverse image lookup, facial recognition, all done by artificial intelligence with very little input apart from right at the beginning from humans. And then, of course, pattern analysis as well in the various sites that do uh, various types of pattern analysis. So when you combine these artificial intelligence programs with um, uniquely human characteristics, it allows for faster, more accurate results. However, the balance must be maintained. So you've got these very technical tools, but they're only going to do a part of that job. And this is where I am finding most success right now in my investigations and in my research is sharing information, so networking, mentorship and artificial intelligence, all of that together is, uh, I believe, key to the successful evolution of our industry. So we'll just talk briefly about um, how this is done. So how each area of the internet uses artificial intelligence to uh, gather information and use information because each part of the internet uses uh, a unique algorithm to process and produce data. So it's worth just reviewing these. So the surface web uh, allows for searching, of course, using keywords, reverse images, multimedia, and some metadata. So the artificial intelligence part of that, of course, is the, uh, the algorithms that we have for uh, search engines to go out there and uh, find information based on keywords that we enter and bring that back. It sounds very obvious and simple, and really it is. We're all very familiar with that and with how um, search engines and the surface web works. 
the deep web, uh, of course, the part of the internet that is really just indexed and database um, collated. So this uh, uses artificial intelligence in areas that we've talked about mostly, which is geospatial intelligence, automated intelligence analysis, and data scraping. So finding information from various parts of the web, bringing it together into databases or creating databases around open source intelligence. So things like telephone directories um, and people finder sites, if you think about those kind of things as deep websites. Then of course, we've got social media research. Now, this is one area where it has actually remained intrinsically human for the most part at the moment. It often requires behavioral profiling, association of property, location, activities, and relationships. However, there are emerging tools and technologies that still require extensive human analysis. So lots of tools out there that will allow you to pull information from various social media sites and do some rudiment rudimentary analysis of that. But it still very much requires um, human input from uh, you know the information that you get across various sites. So you can use a certain tool that will cover Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but still misses out various other social media sites. Or it provides certain information, but only on one username, and you still have to process that information. You still have to go in there and look at the history, and um, if you're trying to do a profile. So, um, you know, every month, a lot of these uh, social media developers and, and developers of all kinds of AI technology send me their products for review. And, uh, and so I review these. So I'm, I stay fairly current on the new technologies and the emerging tools that are out there. And I still see a lot of gaps in that. We are improving in terms of artificial intelligence and automation. However, nothing will replace human analysis, in my view. So then the dark web, uh, this is the area also called the dark net often, uh, the area of the World Wide Web that uses, uh, I think is artificial intelligence is probably most useful in this space. So this is the area that you have to use a certain browser or certain tools to access the dark web. Can't ex access the dark web using um, regular search engines or open source tools and resources. Um, and it's very, very difficult to map the dark web because what you have when you have a, a dark web address with a dot onion top level domain name is only a rendezvous point. It doesn't necessarily give you the location of the actual data that you're looking for. Now, the development in this area is where I see artificial intelligence mostly shining because there are some excellent tools emerging that are able to map and track content on the dark web. Now, this is very, very useful, of course, because you know that area of the web is where we see a lot of the criminal, uh, illegal, and illicit content. And a lot of the people go there purely for the purposes of anonymity. It's not just that purpose. Um, there are some uh, you know, very legitimate uh, functions of the dark web for privacy and anonymity uh, in investigation as well. However, um, a lot of that is based on uh, criminals. Now, the other thing that's coming out of the dark web that I'm very deeply entrenched in right now and uh, will be doing more and more work in this space is on the subject of dig digital currencies, not just Bitcoin, but uh, a lot of the smaller coins that are emerging, such as Monero, uh, where it's focused on privacy and anonymity in uh, online transactions. And this is not just financial transactions, but transactions in terms of data and programs and tools and content. So again, this is an area where artificial intelligence is really going to come into its own and also an area where if you're not familiar with the dark web, you're not familiar with on at least a, a simple rudimentary level in terms of digital currency, I would encourage you to do so. And if you need any help with that, please reach out to me because I have some excellent resources and some excellent contacts in that world. So uh, I'd be happy to, to help you with that. And um, it's an area that I've really uh, started to develop my expertise of the last year or so. So this, here's some examples of, uh, of research and investigation that I've done 
using uh, augmented intelligence over these last few months. These are not necessarily case specific examples, but more specific examples of the types of things that I've investigated, the types of um, work that's starting to come my way using this type of tool. And, so, and these will be familiar to you. These are investigations that a lot of us do a lot of the time, but you may not realize that augmented intelligence is really what you're doing. So when we talk about uh, coercive control, stalking, cult victim targeting, now I'm working more and more, or I seem to be attracting the, uh, the types of work more and more that deals with cults and coercive control, mind control, brainwashing. And I know a lot of people listen to that and think, well, it's a, it's a very small percentage of the work that you may do. But this covers everything from domestic violence cases where there has been coercive control, um, sexual harassment in the workplace is also coercive control, stalking, online stalking, we hear about this all the time, blackmail. All of the tools, all, most of the tools that we use to investigate these types of things are augmented intelligence, a combination of physical investigation. So we're, we're doing forensics on somebody's computer or phone to see if there's tracking software. We're sweeping somebody's house for bugs. We're putting cameras outside somebody's house, all that uh, very um, physical investigation. But then we're also doing um, social media uh, profiling. We're looking for um, access for you know the victim, uh, the perpetrator to have to the victim. We're looking at duplicated websites. We're looking at the sharing of illicit photographs. All of that involves the use of augmented intelligence. So, the kind of tools that we'd use for that, of course, uh, surface web keyword and reverse image searching. I use reverse image searching all the time uh, in my investigations and to develop. You know, when you have just a photograph that somebody's put online, a quick reverse image search using various uh, surface and deep web tools will often identify the perpetrator based on where that original image is or where that image was stolen from. Um, social media, uh, of course, you know, one of the fundamentals of investigation when it comes to any kind of stalking is um, social media pro uh, profiling. I profile the victim as much as I profile the uh, perpetrator or the suspected per perpetrator when it comes to cult investigations. And when I talk about cults, I'm not talking necessarily just about um, these highly organized and recognizable cults. I'm talking about cult mindset, which also includes things like terrorism. So terrorism and online radicalization is cult mindset. So think bigger in terms of when you're using the word cult, we're talking about brainwashing, talking about indoctrination into a certain group or a certain way of thinking or a certain mindset. This can be anything from um, these lifestyle coaches that you see right through to spiritual groups. There are certain definitions of what a cult is. So have a look at that, look into it and see whether or not um, that factors into investigations that you're doing. Talk about geographic profiling. Well, artificial intelligence is essential. Um, really geographic profiling cannot be effective without augmented intelligence. Um, I've taken the geographic profiling courses. I, I'm well versed in that. I've used it on uh, several serial type investigations and human analysis is absolutely essential, but it also cannot be done without technology, without tools, it cannot be done effectively. So uh, you need that uh, analysis and context, both in a human and in a, an artificial intelligence uh, context. And then of course the dark web. So with the dark web, it's very, very difficult to search, if not impossible. There are some search engines that cover the dark web, but these are more for static um, websites, if you like, static rendezvous points where the same um, URL is used over and over again. Now that's not uh, the case for many dark web sites. They move around, they're dynamic, they pop up here and there, the rendezvous point might stay the same, but the actual content may move around and change. 
So, and then of course there's message forums and, and it's very difficult to access much of the content in the dark web without entering usernames and passwords and actually getting yourself in, in there fairly, in a fairly deep and committed way that really cannot easily be automated. So I would say the area of the dark web is the place where artificial intelligence can shine in terms of um, mapping it, but the human element of the dark web is where the investigation um, will be most effective. So uh, you you cannot have a, a, a decent dark web investigation, in my experience, without really getting in there and, uh, and pursuing it um, as a human. So um, that, that's been my experience, certainly recently in some of the investigations I've done, and particularly when I'm trying to track or trace digital currency in that realm. And then, of course, the deep web. So the deep web being the part of the web with, uh, with databases. Um, this is where, you know, you enter information as a human and artificial intelligence really takes over at this point. It's, uh, you know, deep web sites are excellent at collating, gathering information, analysis. This is where uh, artificial intelligence um, is mostly used, where we recognize it the most and where I use it the most uh, in my investigations. So you can really let the dark web, uh, let the deep web do its thing. When we look at uh, people finding sites, when we look at um, transportation, certain analysis tools that's all deep web stuff very very effective and uh and artificial intelligence has been working very well there for a number of years so ultimately when we're talking about um gathering information doing investigation it comes down to this ultimately if we know ourselves extremely well our strengths our biases our, pas our passions our morals we've talked about our uh, our moral compass bringing all of those three things together. And then we take the time to understand what the technology is capable of. And we combine that with collaboration with our fellow professionals, seek mentors to guide us through our knowledge gaps, uh, or just to hold us accountable, just to ensure that we're progressing. I really, really believe that we can not only elevate uh, the entire industry for ourselves and for future generations, but I really believe that we can actually change the world. You can find my information on julieclegofficial.com. That website will be up tomorrow. It's down for maintenance today, unfortunately, but it will be up tomorrow. Uh, you can also email me at julie at human-i.org. And you can hit me up on Twitter. I'm, I'm on social media constantly. So at huntedjulie is my Twitter handle. So by all means, reach out to me there, follow me, uh, uh, direct message me. If you want to send a DM, I'll follow you back. And, um, and so we can, we can communicate if you have any questions outside of this. So uh, I'll take questions. I'm going to have a look through the, the questions here on the, on the chat and uh, any questions that come in, I will answer. So um, please submit those and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Hi, Julie. It's Liz. We want to thank Hi, you so much for your time today. I know that we're at the end of our hour, so some yeah. people might have to hop off. However, why don't we, since you have your information here, we just want to say to those who do need to leave um, that we thank you for being an attendee at our webinar today. And we thank SLA as well along with Aurora WDC. And we have that reconverge.net that we hope um, to see you at as well. So we will stay for those who need to sign off. Thank you again. And uh, we hope that you visit our other webinars. We're going to have one every month and we will stay on. I have a few questions here queued up for you. And as well, we can probably address the questions via email or some other form if we can't get to them all. How does that sound? Yeah, if there's any questions that we don't get to, uh, I'm happy to if you if you send those questions to me. Um, if there's if there's a lot, then I will I can always record a, a video answering them if the if there's too many, um, or I can answer them by email. So that's fine. Okay. Well, here's one. Yes. From this, um, let's see. This attendee here is doing a master's degree in information, specializing in machine learning 
information visualization and that program. Mm -hmm. And she would like to know, um, let's see, if you offer any online courses or mentorship programs. Okay, so thanks for that question. So in uh, a, probably a couple of months, I'm going to be launching my mentorship program. And uh, this will be mentorship by a number of global experts in all kinds of subjects from um, geospatial intelligence to artificial intelligence and machine learning. But in the meantime, um, if this, if that attendee would like to email me directly, I'll certainly send some resources that I have and uh, point that person in the direction of um, some of the mentors that I know in that area um, and some of the content that I know that would, would assist with that. Okay, we have, do we have your email address? Yep, it's on the, it's on the slide there. So Julie, oh, okay. yeah, human eye. So, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel employers have great enough appreciation or understanding of the human element in CI? How can we share this with them at this important time? That's a great question, and, I, and in my experience, uh, some employers are really, really on board with um, understanding the uh, understanding of augmented intelligence, uh, and then you get people that are very, depending on the generation and depending on how progressive they are, that are really um, old school and they prefer the human element of it. So they are much more about. Um, I was, at, I was at such an organization the other day, an investigation firm, and they were saying, we don't know the first thing about um, artificial intelligence. We don't know the first thing about computers. So we do things old school. And, and then there's other companies that do everything uh, computerized. They really believe in the technology, but they're losing sight of that human element. They think, you know, it's, it's faster, it's more cost effective, it's gonna be, you know, they're gonna be able to produce and process much more information uh, much more cheaply just by installing a couple of computer programs. So I think, you know, there, there does need to be education. There does need to be a lot of explanation that one cannot exist without the other in this day and age. And I don't see that changing going forward. We have to let people know and, and talk to our employers and, uh, you know, share this video, share, share the resources that are out there that, talk about augmented intelligence and talk about the effectiveness of speeding up the data processing part using machinery and still making sure that our investigations are effective using human analysis. That's wonderful. Another question comes in, do you have any suggestions for the best way to approach multi-directional mentorships? So uh, again, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be forming or creating over the next month, uh, just before my book is launched, I'm going to be creating a community, a world-class investigator community. And the idea behind that is it's a place where everybody in this industry can go, wh whichever um, generation you're part of, and find resources, find people to help them, whether you're lacking in technological knowledge or whether you're a, you're a young person that needs help and experience in learning um, about the, you know, the the more uh, detective side of things, the, those skills that are that come from experience rather than can be taught. So I'm hoping that you know I can get as many people as possible into that community, and we can all start to share information. And and this is where, you know, I don't want to, I don't need people sharing their cases. I don't need people sharing their workload. But it's somewhere that you can go to ask questions and ask for help and not be judged and feel uh, like you're part of a collaborative community. I really feel that, that that's lacking right now. And I'm hoping that that community, as soon as it's created, uh, will uh, help to bridge that gap. So I would encourage you, as uh, if you go to my website, julieclegofficial.com, add your name to my mailing list. And when I launch that community, I, I, I will send that information out to you. You can join that community. And hopefully, the more people that join it, uh, as Metcalfe's Law states, the more people that are in that network, the more valuable that network will become. Yes, thank you for providing that, julieclegofficial.com.
So another question, I'm probably the last one we'll have time for here. Another difficulty I see in automating intel gathering is that you need pervasive big brother like technology and tools to capture the important signals you seek. That means people must sacrifice their privacy to levels beyond what most people are comfortable with today. Also, the bad guys or groups intent on keeping secrets are excellent at keeping their tracks off anything grid. As such, will we really ever be able to automate further when people only share what they want us to see and hide the stuff they don't? This is a great question, and I could talk about this subject all day. I'm, uh, I'm a huge privacy advocate. <laughs> I won't, though. <laughs> but, um, so I'm a huge private, privacy advocate, and it's, this, this question is exactly the reason why I got involved in the TV show. It was, uh, it was meant to showcase whether or not it's possible to live off the grid in 21st century Britain, because you know the governments are... Um, they have more and more intrusive surveillance for all of us. Uh, we are required more and more to provide our information to websites and services when we want to use those. And it's very clear uh, every day you hear in the news about our information being sold or lost or hacked. Um, so, you know, we are we are living in a society where our privacy is being significantly eroded. And this, this person makes a great point that the criminals are really, really good at hiding their information because they are not constrained typically by the law. They're not constrained by our moral compass and our uh, requirement to act in an ethical way when we're investigating. And it does create an issue. It does create a gap. This is one of the reasons why I feel that collaboration is extremely important because we are able, I am able in my investigations to collaborate with people who are in regions where the laws are not as restrictive as the laws in this country. I'm going to give you a quick example. Um, there was a case very recently that really made me think. Um, it was a case in Australia where the Australian police had taken over the running in the dark web of a child exploitation website. And the way that the criminals kept the police out of this website and out of this um, forum in the dark web was by requiring everybody that posted in that forum to post a picture of child sexual abuse with every message that they posted. And of course, the police are not allowed to post pictures of child sexual abuse in any circumstance except in Australia so this was an American case it was a it was an American and I believe a Canadian that went to the United States and met up and sexually abused a four-year-old child now they were arrested and as part of that investigation the as part of the plea bargain one of those criminals agreed to give up his username and password to that forum um, and and he was one of the administrators now of course the when the american police went into that forum they realized that they could not operate and could not investigate in that forum because they were not able to access any of the material unless they provided proof that they weren't police by sharing child pornography images so they moved that investigation to the one area in the world where that law does not exist and that's australia the Australian police ran that forum for a year, sharing pictures of child exploitation um, and child sexual abuse victims. And they arrested, I, I don't know how many uh, sexual offenders they arrested, but apparently it was a, a large number. It was a very considered to be a very successful operation. I have a hard time knowing how I feel about it, honestly. I the my the police side of me says we must never share child sexual abuse images under any circumstances that's how i policed and, and my moral compass is firmly in that camp but then on the other hand just as as this individual who's raised this question talks about how do we ever get ahead of these criminals if we don't start using their methodology and being creative in the way that we investigate so that's that's a case that highlights that there are ways around it but it's um, you know, it does call into question our moral, uh, our morals and ethics based on how we how we operate. 
and I know I've gone over time here, but I just wanted to really answer that question because it's complicated, but it's a great question. It is. That is a very deep question. Thank you for your wonderful response. Thank <laughs> no you problem. very much, Julie. And we look forward to visiting julieclegofficial.com and for your book that will be coming out along with your podcast and Twitter. So thank you for your time today. Absolutely. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, as I said, the website's not up today, but it will be up tomorrow. In the meantime, uh, by all means, uh, follow me on social media, talk to me there, or send me an email, and I'll be happy to respond to any other questions. Thank you so much. No and problem. To let, to let all of our listeners know, next up on Wednesday, February 28th at noon Eastern time, join Jim Miller as he hosts Super CI guest speaker J.P. Radicek. Director of Intelligence Systems for Aurora WDC. This is a new format. It will be a half an hour webinar where you will learn how three companies are using AI to power intelligent taxonomies. And once again, please remember that we have that reconverge for Aurora WDC. And that is going to be the G2 Intelligence Leadership Symposium, April 24th through 26th in Madison, Wisconsin, focusing on culture and values of our intelligence practice. So that's once again, reconverge.net. Thank everybody. Thank you all for attending today's session. And we hope to see you back again on Wednesday, February 28th for JP Radicek. This is Elizabeth Lamoureux signing off. Thank you. <laughs>